Good morning. I'm Liz Kenick. I'm president of Teachers in Space. We're an educational nonprofit dedicated to getting teachers to space and returning them safely to their classrooms. While we prepare for those opportunities, which are just now becoming real, we have spent the past 10 years building and flying experiments with teachers and their students for flight on stratospheric balloons, a stratospheric glider, a suborbital space vehicle. And now we have an orbital satellite that we're preparing to launch. So we're gonna to talk today about whether we learn best from success or from failure when we are engineering, when we're teaching, when we're experimenting. And our panelists include engineers and professors people with a lot of years of experience. We're excited to have them with us. I'm gonna start now by telling you a little more about Teachers in Space, and then I will introduce our panelists. I'm not changing slides. Okay, awesome. So we began in 2011 with a NASA grant producing workshops in the summer, a week long at a time for groups of about 30 teachers from across the US. They could be from K to 12. And we've had some amazing experiments built by these teachers, sometimes as young as preschool, doing marshmallows in space, keeping track of what happens as air pressure reduces. What does that do to a marshmallow? And what happens when the marshmallow returns to Earth? And we've also had a really impressive experiment built by an 11th grade student and his teacher, who is one of our panelists. Uh, comparing the radiation readings from a Geiger counter that is unprotected to a similar Geiger, Geiger counter that has radiation protection on it. We found that repeatedly on different types of vehicles and students really enjoy working with the data from that experiment. We have flown over a hundred successful experiments to date. Um, we just had the loss of our first orbital satellite in September of this year. It flew from Vandenberg Space Force Base. The rocket lasted for about two minutes, beautiful launch, but it had a failure of an engine and had to be destroyed. So we'll have a couple minutes to talk about that. We are rebuilding, they are rebuilding. We're gonna launch again by the end of December. Um, we had a lot of success to get to that point. One briefly catastrophic failure and now more successes ahead. So lots to talk about there. These are some pictures of some of the things that we have done over the years, beginning in 2015 with the 1U 3D printed CubeSats with Arduinos. You can see the one on the upper left has the colored marshmallows in it, and the one on the right, upper right, has the radiation experiment with the Geiger counters. Sixth graders in Syracuse, upper left corner, um, entered their experiment in a science competition and received money to continue their research. And in eighth grade, we're still working on experiments based on what they began doing with these balloon experiments. Um, and the students in the center bottom picture are learning soldering and building Arduinos. That's at a high school in Queens, New York. These are some of the space experiences we have been part of. We sent experiments in 2014 to the International Space Station. These were designed by teachers and students. And Kendra is with us. She was a launch engineer and saw some of these experiments get flown. Um, in the lower right corner is the brand new company Firefly, whose rocket was the one that we were on the first launch. This is not unusual. I understand that every company has had to destroy their first launch, and we're excited that they are ready to launch again, hopefully by the end of the year, and have promised us yet another flight for our payload. So um, we're looking forward to that. And we have Hashi Sudler from Villanova University has an experiment flying on that. He's on our panel. Serenity is this CubeSat that we built for Firefly. It's a 3U version of the CubeSat. You can see that it has a tape measure antenna strapped down, ready for loading. That springs into action when the satellite is deployed. It has solar panels. It has the radiation experiment inside it. It has a radio. It has communications. It will fly with Firefly on their next launch. And Joe Luttrell of Cube is here. The engineer who designed and built this thing, and he's been working with us on our CubeSats since the beginning, since the beginning, when we first said, let's see if we can do this on a balloon. 
So um, we're excited to talk to you about the progress of these things from when we began them in 20, really 2014 up until today and what's gonna happen next. Um, one of the things that has concerned me over our years of working with schools, teachers, students, especially on balloon experiments, people love the idea of doing balloon launches. It's relatively inexpensive. You can often do it for under a thousand dollars. It can be done pretty safely. Sometimes it's not done as safely as it should be. You know, it's, it's a little too easy. And sometimes people think it doesn't matter if they lose it. And I think it does matter. I'm concerned if we're teaching STEM, if we're teaching technology and engineering, that that's not just hacking, that we need to follow process. And what we really wanna do is ensure success, that we learn best from success. So in discussing it with the panelists, I started to research it and see what I could find. And I found from the University of Chicago, their research shows that we learn best from our own success, right? I did it, it worked, now I know how to do that. And I'm gonna tell my friends and I'm gonna tell other people. And because I was successful, I can teach them. If they succeed, now they've learned it too. We learn well from other people's successes and from their failures. If we see where they went wrong, we can try to be inspired to help them find a solution. If we see where they went right, we can follow them. We often don't learn from our own failures because it's ego threatening, right? We just wanna move on. We don't wanna talk about it. We don't want the feedback. We reject the feedback. It wasn't our fault. Or we can't figure out how to do better and we don't actually learn from failure until we succeed again. So panelists here today came at this from very different viewpoints depending on whether they are engineers, in which case they will experience a lot of failure and how do they and their teams prepare for that? How do they bring the failure forward in the process so it's not catastrophic, get the best learning, feed it back into the process, enable others to learn from it, move on, get to success. And for teachers, how do you use failure? Teachers on the panel have said to me, we need failure as part of the education process. It's required um, if people only succeed, they don't learn how to prepare for when failure occurs. So really fascinating. And I know that if you're in the audience, you probably see these differences and are looking forward to talking with us about it. Okay, so when we don't learn from failure, because it can be threatening and we tune out and don't get the feedback, that undermines our learning. Here on this slide is the note if you wanna look into the research and read the full article. And this will be recorded too, so you can go back and see this. Um, but right now, what I wanna do is bring up our panelists. That's me in the upper left inside the Perlan glider, the stratospheric glider that set world records while carrying our teacher and student built experiments in 2016 and 17 and 18. Um, it's got, it's in the hangar and it doesn't yet have its wings on you can see its trailer in the back. The wings come off when the plane goes into the trailer and it's got protective film over the windows. It reminded me of the Virgin spaceship. And so I loved that I was allowed to climb inside it. And uh, we've got Stephanie is here from the Challenger Center in Las Cruces. Ashi is the professor at Villanova who's teaching CubeSats and blockchain. Barbie is education specialist at NASA. I've got Kendra Toole has been a launch engineer at a number of companies, at ATK, at SpaceX, and at Blue Origin. Chaz is Spaceport Engineer at Spaceport America. Joe is the founder of Cube, um, the CubeSat company. And Chris Murphy is our teacher, our science teacher at Gloversville High School in New York, whose student came up with the idea for the radiation experiment. Now I'm gonna let each of them go in order. So Stephanie, take over. Should I stop sharing my screen? Stephanie, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Stephanie Hofackett, and I, um, I'm the Associate Director of Teaching and Learning for the Las Cruces Public School District. And I also um, run the Challenger Learning Center of Las Cruces in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it's wonderful to be here this morning. 
Hashi Sudler, Villanova. Sure, thanks a lot, Liz. Hi, my name is Hashi Sudler. I'm a professor at Villanova University in their engineering school. Uh, I teach in two uh, primary areas, cybersecurity and in blockchain technology. Uh, and in addition to that, we do quite a bit of research. Uh, a lot of my recent research has been in the area of blockchain and a very fascinating emerging technology. Uh, and as uh, we'll talk a little bit later, uh, blockchain is also intersecting with space uh, to see how it will behave in space. And there's quite a number of organizations very interested in extending this technology into the space region. Thank you. Barbie. Hi, I'm, a, uh, as Liz said, an education specialist uh, at NASA Goddard. Um, I'm on the NASA EPDC contract through uh, Texas State University. And uh, I, prior to coming to work with NASA, I was a 20-some year educator, uh, high school. And um, I also participated in uh, the summer program, um, both in Florida and in California, with the Teachers in Space program quite a few years ago. <laughs> Thanks. Kendra? I, uh, I, like Liz said, I'm a former launch operations engineer. I worked on Falcon 9 and Terry's and New Shepard for Blue Origin. And in my past, I actually just realized that I had experience loading some of Liz's past payloads for teachers in space on Terry's. And I've also gotten to see some of her programs fly on Blue Origin as well. Chaz. Hello, I'm Chaz Miller. I'm a spaceport engineer at Spaceport America here in New Mexico. Um, my background starts back as an engineer in the commercial semiconductor industry um, at Bell Labs uh, in that, at that uh, occupation for 20 years. Then I returned to school to learn planetary science at New Mexico State University. I got my doctorate in 2013, and that winding path landed me in Spaceport America at the end of that. So this, this is a really great group. I'm excited to have them here. What I'm going to do now is bring up some slides and start talking about some concepts. And then I'm going to invite the panelists to jump in and give us some of their perspective on each of these topics. And we are also open to receiving questions from our audience. And Noah from Teachers in Space is here with me in the room. and He's going to help me moderate those questions. So let me see if I can bring my slides back up for you. And here, and here, and here, right? Oh, I have to share the screen again, sorry. Um, before we do that, can we hear from Joe and Chris? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Joe, go, while I'm figuring this out. Okay, my name is Joe Luttrell. I am the founder of a company called Cube. We design and design, build, and operate satellites from CubeSats to a new form factor called Pocket Cube. Uh, my background is well, I've done a little of everything. I've built houses, uh, I've worked in water quality, I've built satellites, rockets, and if it's something that's cool and interesting, I've probably tried to make it happen. Uh, some with success, some with failure, and uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. And Chris, is Chris with us yet? Yes, I am. Awesome. Welcome. Um, I'm you. currently, uh, my name is Chris Murphy. I'm currently teaching uh, middle school at the middle school in upstate New York in Gloversville. Um, I'm currently teaching earth science. Um, I've taught earth science and physics both at the middle school, high school, and college level. Um, in 2012, I actually participated in probably the second year that Teachers in Space came back. Um, and that workshop pushed me towards uh, high altitude balloons. So um, I'm currently the, on the board of directors, uh, serving director of high altitude balloons with uh, teachers in space. Um, and through that experience, I've created a student-centered club where we launch um, HAB or high altitude balloons. Um, and they develop, the students develop, design, build, and fly those experiments um, on those balloons. Um, to date, we've had 14 successful uh, missions. We try to get three a year. Um, and hopefully in another month or so, we're going to get another one in the air. So, <clears throat> so hopefully, uh, you know, things go well. Um, I've also worked with the Perlin glider. Um, and, uh, as Liz was saying, one of our students, um, had a radiation experiment that's, uh, flown on the glider, um, and a couple different rockets now at this point. And Chris, you take an engineering approach with your high altitude club. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
and that's going to play into what we're talking about for sure, because a lot of the process is what um, I'll be discussing in, uh, in during the topics. Thank you. All right. So um, first thing that is dear to my heart is that hacking is not engineering. With STEM, um, I have seen in the past several years a lot of excitement about hacking, a lot of hacking events. We're going to get together. It's going to be fun. We're going to do stuff real quick. And then a concern that often comes afterwards is, okay, but how do we actually implement that? And so in talking to engineers, I see that there are times when hacking is appropriate, but needs to be fed back into the engineering process unless it is a quick fix for a single occurrence. In order to make something into a product that's supportable, that's been tested, that you know the full range of its capabilities and when it's likely to fail, that's where you need engineering. So... This is my slide, this is what I think, and then the panelists may have different or even better opinions, and so may you in the audience, but let's start with this, the way I see it. Engineering follows a defined organized methodology. My background, I'm trained as a systems engineer and a software engineer. Um, there are many, many other kinds of engineering, but this is the kind that I'm familiar with. Taking a systemic approach to achieve the best solution, looking at the whole system, including the people and the processes, not just the technology. And then starting at the beginning, what are we gonna build? What's it supposed to do? How do we design it to do that? Build and then test, but that doesn't mean that you build before you test. It's not like mousetrap where you don't ever test it until the end and then it doesn't work, right? And so as we get into the discussion further in this panel, you're gonna see some different systems design and systems process diagrams that attempt to bring tests earlier in the cycle. The earlier you test, the earlier you can find potential failures, the cheaper and easier it is to correct them. And some people like a loop model. Some people say that's infinite. You have to finish it and then move on, whatever, right? These are all models, not reality, but it's good to have the models. And I know computer teachers who keep the models up in their classrooms. They're constantly referring to it. But basically, requirements, design, build, test. And then, because it's a system, documentation, training, support, and management, all the people stuff, all the human factors that are part of success or failure. Hacking is shortcuts to a quick solution. I don't have time for all this stuff. All this stuff is good, but I need it now. I need it in the next 30 minutes. I need it in two weeks. So what are we going to do? We're either going to adapt an existing tool to do something new, right? That's typically what we do, but it's all about speed. It's all about getting to that success for this acute problem, this one thing that we need to solve right now, and therefore often involves breaking through security controls and limits. Now, some people get excited about that piece and think that that's what hacking is, and hacking the term can be used in many ways, but let's talk a little more about that. And I'm going to ask Hashi in a minute to go even deeper. But first, just, just on this, Kendra, when we were discussing it, you said that hacking can get us to success without the depth of understanding that engineering can provide. Would you like to expand on that right now? Yeah, I think I, um, in my in my experience with launch operations, there's so many things that you have to test the limits on. And so Often we do go in with things designed and with limits identified, but that you can't get everything, you can't get everything tested in the schedule that we have trying to put people into space. Sometimes you have to take something out and really just test its limitations and uh, see what you come up with and hack solutions. It's a term, I call it throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what sticks. Um, maybe don't say that when you're interviewing for jobs or <laughs> trying to work in launch operations, but you can take a, a mission or you can take a program and you can see where its limits exist in some intensive testing or hack-based testing, I think. That's my opinion. And Barbie, um, you said that sometimes hacking can have negative connotations from an education perspective. Can you tell us more about that? Right. I mean, whenever you look at the, I would say, I guess, pure definition of hacking, it's, you know, gaining, you know, 
gaining unauthorized access to data in a system or computer. And so I think uh, hacking in, in its general nature can have a, um, a negative connotation in terms of doing something, um, I'll put the quotes there, illegal or something that, that shouldn't be done. Um, of course, I think to me, the way we're talking about hacking here is more of a, an informal way. But as far as in the classroom with students, uh, you want to make sure that you're not encouraging them to really take shortcuts that they're not supposed to be taking. Uh, and, and, and I think if you look at more of an engineering design process in that, in that direction, that it would be more helpful to talk about those types of changes. Thanks. Thank you. So Hashi, now you gave us a definition from MIT, forcing a system to do more than originally intended. Uh, let me turn these slides over to you. I think these are your slides. Mute, unmute, unmute Hashi. Unmute. There you go. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, super. Uh, yeah, and, and this slide um, has some contributions from a variety of the panelists here. Uh, <clears throat> what's very interesting about um, hacking is that although it's, it's very technical, it, it certainly has uh, a number of definitions that have evolved over the years. Uh, the, the term was actually originally coined at MIT back in the 1960s that really defined um, individuals who were thinking out of the box, they were looking for non-standard solutions uh, to problems. Uh, so so would, they would essentially innovate, uh, rapid innovation to create uh, solutions to get things to work. Uh, over uh, the next de decade of the 1970s, the term uh, evolved into people who were very focused on computers. Uh, they were looking to do rapid application development. Uh, they were obsessed with coding. And, and what they did is they really came up with uh, solutions uh, in a computer program sense uh, to get things to work. Um, over the 1980s and, and even to today, we, we do know uh, quite a bit of the more uh, pejorative term uh, where hacking is viewed as individuals who are breaking into systems who are going beyond uh, legal limits uh, to access systems uh, when they should not or taking uh, digital information that they shouldn't. Um, but the term as we're using it in this forum is really innovating, rapid innovation and you know the points that were made by a number of you is uh, it's a way of getting to solutions very quickly. It's a way of doing rapid prototyping. Uh, it's a way of getting away from all of the formal engineering processes to get to those solutions. And then all of that is correct. Uh, and if we really were to boil down the essential difference between hacking and engineering, um, hacking essentially takes an existing system. Uh, the system has some defined limits. Uh, perhaps the manufacturer that created those uh, engineered systems uh, have documented what the limits are and how the system is intended to work. But what hacking does is it looks beyond those limits and it says, we're going to get this system to work the way I want it to work or to solve a particular problem uh, that has presented itself that no one really anticipated. But I think the illustration here that was contributed from some others on the panel uh, looks at Apollo 13 and, and we know what happened with Apollo 13. It was a mission that had some problems early in the, in the flight. And they had to really rethink uh, the whole mission objective. It was no longer landing on the moon. It was just getting the astronauts back. And in the process of getting them back, uh, they had to hack a uh, solution very quickly uh, in order to keep them alive. Uh, so hacking has obviously a very important place in our lives. Uh, and it's very needed once we, we really are faced with challenges. Uh, but, but this here uh, illustration shows when engineers had to rapidly come up with a carbon scrubber uh, to keep uh, the carbon levels from building up too much uh, in the command module. So, so those are the essential differences between hacking and engineering. Thank you very much. Um, and let's see, is there anybody that wants to jump in? I was curious, Joe, you had mentioned something once about remembering when we had to hack bits and bytes of memory. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, early on when I was doing software development, um, you know, and anyone who's got gray hair will, will remember this. Uh, when you have 4K of memory and you're working with it and you're trying to get your program to run, and you are going to be hacking some solutions together. You're going to be using the information that you have in this engineering format, but you're going to have to try and figure a way of breaking things. Uh, for example, we needed exactly four more bytes 
to make a program work. We had to have it. It wasn't available in memory. So we introduced a way of jumping into a loop in the middle of it so that this one loop would function, would actually have two functions. And by doing that, we were able to successfully get the program with a little bit of memory to spare. Okay, we're talking maybe three bytes of memory to spare. But by doing that kind of work, that hack, so to speak, we were able to solve the problem. So from a, from a real world perspective, um, sometimes you have to hack the solution. If you document it, it becomes an engineering process. If you skip that step, then nobody knows what you did. And there's a lot of situations, especially in the old Atari days where they programmed them, where nobody knows how the original code was written. They hacked it together, there's no documentation, and so those programs are basically lost forever. Thanks. And Chaz, I'll bet that in your experience as an engineer, you have had plenty of opportunities to switch among engineering and hacking. Um, true. Um, uh, in my experience of doing semiconductor design, that was intended for a production uh, flow. So what you did had to work all the time. So it was a pretty developed and regular process. In my later life as a researcher, in uh, planetary science, I, I ran into that quite a bit. And one of my projects was to take some NASA code that simulated an atmosphere and convert it to another planetary body's atmosphere and see if we could do that. And the code was what one person referred to as spaghetti code. It had evolved over many years, over many different people. And it wasn't well documented. There were all kinds of kludges and fixes and go-to loops inside of go-to loops, all kinds of things you didn't want to do. And clearly it was done to solve a particular problem. And it was a huge effort to try to back engineer some of that work. And in fact, in some ways, you know, the project didn't work because of that. So as far as Joe says, it's not well documented. It, the hack was fine for whoever did it. It worked once. And so that's all they needed to do, but it wasn't something you could regularly reproduce. So if you're working in something like building a rocket and your intent is to get it to go to orbit one time ever, well, okay, you can hack and one day you'll get it, maybe. Uh, but if your intent is the first time it gets to orbit from then on, you continuously do that. You need an engineering process to know that you can repeat what you did. And as Kendra pointed out, you have margins that you can count on. Engineering gives us repeatability. Thank you. I have to say spaghetti is a technical term now. <laughs> yes, <so. laughs> it, 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 it means and be also, careful. Yes. I do want to say, Liz, I think something that's important that Chaz, Joe, and Hashti have said in their examples is that I believe there's responsible hacking. All of these hacking situations took place in environments with a sandbox of safety, of a very well-engineered sandbox, and they're experts who are now responsibly hacking within a sandbox that they've engineered and developed. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we talked about some engineering design processes. Here's one. Hashi, this is still your slide, so go on, tell us more. Yeah, and let's, let's talk a little bit about what really distinguishes engineering. Um, now, both engineering and hacking are technical activities, uh, but what really distinguishes engineering is this element of design. Uh, engineering is really all about designing uh, how the system is intended to work, and engineering leverages mathematics very heavily in order to really understand all the parameters to be able to predict and to model what this system uh, is supposed to do. Uh, so you can see there, there's an illustration there of mathematics. And, and the beauty of math is that uh, you can think of it as this other world, this virtual world that engineers move into. They take things from the physical world, they take it into a virtual world of mathematics, they can model it, uh, and then they can change things, they can test it, they can see how it ought to behave, uh, and they can make all sorts of design decisions from that point, and then move what they've learned back into the physical world to actually build the system. Now, not all of the mathematics may re reflect reality. It depends on uh, how much you've modeled the system. So engineers go back and forth between reality and mathematics to get better models uh, so they can do better predictions. Uh, but that's the one element, uh, and it's a disciplined process. Uh, and as you've been talking here, if you do hacking without the discipline, it, it's not engineering. But once you start adding those layers of discipline, starting with documentation, modeling, repeatability, 
that's when it becomes an engineered process. Chris, you have a technology background. How does this fit in with the way that you lead your students and your High Altitude Achievement Club? Well, it's it's funny you say that because I was actually going to speak to um, part of this um, later on in the presentation. But I think one of the biggest things that we found um, that the process didn't always come first. And I guess that's what kind of like what how she's saying here is that you know, we had set goals on what we were looking for as far as success goes. And when we did that, um, there were things that we hacked along the way to get our, you know, get that first goal. Our first goal was to have an experiment, go up in the air um, and actually launch it successfully from somewhere. And we didn't even have, you know, I mean, we, we were hoping to recover and, you know, that was all great. Um, but during that process, when we got our first one out, we were you know, in between two and our Easter's. And so we were just trying to get that thing in the air um, and get data from it and see what happened. And so, you know, through that process, we learned a ton of things that we needed to design and set up as, in a, you know, as an engineering process, um, you know, through that first launch. And so, you know, that falls right into it. You know, that the engineering part kind of came later. Um, by necessity because there were things that went wrong that you know even though it was a successful launch and recovery things went wrong that we needed to fix and in order to do that we needed a process and um, that engineering process certainly came into play um in the days after um you know after recovery awesome awesome there are other engineering design processes if you google engineering design you'll get pages of engineering design processes way back when I was learning this stuff in the late 90s and working in software engineering, first at Black & Decker and then at Morgan Stanley, one of the things that was happening at that time was moving systems from big mainframes where they'd been running for quite a while onto distributed computing, onto client server applications, running 24 hours, running processes, in London that could be responded to by somebody in Asia as time changed so that things could always be handed over, could always be accessible from everywhere. The waterfall methodology on the right came from big projects that had to work and you can break out the work into different teams to do the design and the requirements and the analysis and the testing and the build, but it's slow. And if it fails at the end, you have to start over. And so as we moved toward being able to do rapid development and distributed work, we came more to the model on the left of moving very quickly between coming up with a possible design, almost like hacking, and then having a team that included customer service and support, as well as engineers, prototyping it, working through it in workshops, any way to figure out before actually building and implementing it, how it would work and where else it needed to be changed. I'm curious from the educators with us today, from Barbie and Stephanie, um, whether you use models like this with your students and what your thoughts are on engineering design process. Yeah, um, certainly I would love to speak to this on the engineering or on the education side. So we traditionally, our older standards did not include engineering as part of it. Um, they were just science focused. So with the adoption of our new standards, which we have in New Mexico, which are the next generation science standards, engineering is a, a really big piece of that. It's really, it's really exciting. Um, there are eight um, science and engineering practices and students also engage in engineering design process that is similar, um, looks similar to um, the one that um, was on the first slide, that the previous slide. And so really what we're working with our students and engaging with our teachers in is that iterative process of engineering. And we're trying to get ourselves to, to tease away from the scientific method where this is how it's all this linear thing and it goes in this order. But we know that isn't really how it works. Um, you're going back and forth. You might have to research and then design and then have to go back and research. You know, you might create a solution and then you need to refine it again and then communicate it again. So you're kind of going back and forth. You're improving, you're testing. 
Um, you're asking a lot of questions. You're imagining, you're planning, and you're creating. So you're going back and forth. And with students, you know, it's interesting, with, especially with younger students, I find that they're natural engineers. Um, their minds do this all the time. They're going back and forth um, quite easily. And as students get older, they become less um, willing to try to, to go back and forth. They just want to go, like, get it done, right? This is, I just want to complete the task. Um, and so it's really a shift, right? It's a shift to think about it, think about engineering in this way. And instead of a linear way and a circular way, that's um, kind of like, an engineering project life, cy life, life cycle is kind of what I tell students, like you're going to have to keep going um, and you're always going to be improving the design um, regardless of that. So it's exciting and we're doing a lot of work um, with students and teachers to, to use and to have engineering be a, a, have a greater presence in classrooms. And one of the ways we do that is, is by allowing um, or by creating opportunities for students to have project design opportunities where there's constraints involved, um, but there's also measures of success with that engineering task. And so that's been helpful in framing engineering for us, at least in the education world. And I know Barbie has a lot of experience with this as well. So I'd love to hear from her. Yes, thanks. Um, you know, as Stephanie pointed out, you know, the next generation science standards, which New Mexico, but not all states have adopted that, but generally speaking, especially you know, from a national platform, as far as NASA is concerned, we look at the next generation science standards as our lead. And part of their goal is to bring the engineering design process up to the same level as scientific inquiry within the class. And, um, their model is a little bit cyclical. They kind of just have three. Um, at NASA, I guess probably one of our, um, whenever I think about the engineering design process, uh, there's an activity series called BEST, which stands for Beginning Engineering Science and Technology. And the first one that uh, we used there was a six-step process and very cyclical, like the one on the previous slide that, that Stephanie had referred to as well. You know, but it doesn't really show a starting and ending. Um, and so that we've done some revisions and um, coming out shortly uh, will come um, a uh, process that actually shows where you actually start so that you start with the asking the questions. And while we know the engineering process can really start at any point, it can start with just, you know, um, even while you're doing the experiment to know that, hey, there's some other things out here that, that we can look at. But as far as the education process, you know, whenever you're doing an activity with students, you want to have the ask, you want to have the imagine, you want to have the plan. Um, yes, you want to get into the test, experiment, repeat, and improve, but you want to make sure that there's an actual starting point where you can look at requirements and constraints. And um, I love showing pictures um, that, you know, it's like <laughs> there was a requirement, but there should have been a constraint. And so this didn't really work out the way that it should have. Um, but um, and then the other thing is that the new model is going to have a new share out because when education, uh, we want the students to eventually get to an end point to where they come, come can come and share about what they learn. And uh, it's key that, you know, there is a start point And yes, there is an end point as well within the, within the educational setting. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so that sets us up. I think we've got a lot. We could just spend another hour talking about this. But I actually want to address specifically these five questions, and I know that our panelists are prepared to discuss them. How do you use success and failure for learning in your environment as an engineer, as an educator? Is one more important than the other? Do you treat them differently? How do you prepare your teams to succeed? How do you prepare to learn from success or failure? So that's kind of supporting the first question, right? How, how are they different from each other? And then how do you prepare to learn from either one? When can we learn more from failure? I heard some interesting comments on this as we were preparing for today. And when the failure occurs, what is required to produce learning, how to overcome? So these are all interrelated, but let's take them one at a time. Um, I like this picture because this is from 2016. In Argentina, the Perlan glider had arrived in Argentina for its first flights outside of the U.S. to try to ride 
the mountain wave at the change of the seasons when the polar vortex hits the Andes and creates such an uplift that world records can and have been set. Perland team set the world record for altitude in a glider with their first glider and Perland two was designed to be able to go higher and they achieved that. They hold more world records now. Um, they supported Teachers in Space for a year in teaching teachers, doing video conferences, how to build experiments to fit inside these 1U CubeSats and we could fly four at a time inside the tail of the Perlin glider. So I have arrived in Argentina and I'm unpacking the crate of CubeSats to see what it is that's going to fly and to get their batteries charged up. And here's what I found. Of the 42 schools that initially enrolled in this free program, we did put them through an engineering process. There were checkpoints and reviews and not all of them were able to complete the session, which we expected, right? That, that some would find it beyond them and that would be okay. They could come back and try again. Um, it just means that they won't be able to get their CubeSat built and delivered on time. And we all know that. Um, it, extreme deadlines to get our orbital CubeSat built and delivered to Firefly in time. And same thing with anything that Kendra has dealt with as a payload and launch engineer. So of those 42 schools that initially enrolled, 10 actually met the deadline for delivering built experiments and unpacking them and seeing them for the first time myself, we found six were ready for flight, four needed some more work. So after that summer's flights, we paired the schools whose CubeSats were not quite ready with schools that we felt could help them. Uh, maybe they had a similar experiment or were located close by. And so we began to build a community of schools who helped each other. And Chris, you had a CubeSat that was part of this group. Um, I want to get to you, but first I wanted to ask Barbie to help me with this because Barbie, you suggested that we come up with some key terms right at the very beginning. We've already worked on that with hacking and engineering, but we should also define what do we mean by failure and success? Sorry, let me unmute there. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, and it's funny because whenever I looked it up, failure was somewhat defined based upon like the opposite of success. You know, it's whenever you don't achieve what you set out uh, to do. Um, and so I'll say success is, you know, the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. So before you start, you have to define what your goal is. Um, and then failure would be, you know, whenever you don't reach that desired outcome. And development and testing versus educational contexts. That was something our panel got into. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah. So within the classroom, um, I, I in particular, uh, in teaching physics students, um, they would always get frustrated whenever they failed. Um, you know, they always wanted to get the right answer, whether it was homework, whether it was a test. They, they, just, it, they just always had to be right. It was just a level of students that expected to always have an A, earn an A. And, you know, my concern was that a lot of times you learn from your failure. If, if what you're doing, if you're never pushing yourself to learn new things and challenging yourself to make mistakes and, and learning from those mistakes, um, and then whether you consider that mistake a failure um, or, you know, um, just kind of looking at homework versus test, and during homework time within a classroom, that's an opportunity to have those failures. That's an opportunity to, to, to learn from your mistakes and from those failures. And obviously, whenever it gets down to test time, that's whenever you ultimately want to be successful because you've learned from failures that you've had. Thanks. And Joe, you brought up the concept of successful failure, finding the successes within a failure. Yeah. Um if you, as Barbie had said, when you have a, a specific goal or aim in mind and you fall short of that, well, is it really a failure? You need to look at all the components that you put into the work. Was it something outside your system that caused it? In other words, if you just fail and say, okay, that's it, it doesn't work and move on, you're not learning. You need to learn what, the, what caused the failure. Was it something that you did? Was it a process that you missed? Um, was it some documentation you didn't understand? 
where was that failure? Um, when we work with our interns um, here at Cube, we insist on giving them stuff that's way over their head. Okay. Um, here, I want you to design a, a GPS circuit. And this is for a beginning electronics uh, student who's probably either first year college or uh, high school level. And they look at you with these you know, deer in headlights, like, do you want me to do what? I was like, yes, because I want you to fail at this. When you fail, then you understand the limitations of the hardware that you're working with, or at least the path you're working with. So the more that you can get these rapid small failures and get people to overcome that, then they can be looking at what those successes should be. Um, and it's, re it's an iterative process. I mean, you should fail until you succeed. It, it's basically fail, document what you did, analyze what you did, take, take time. A lot of people fail, move on. Take the time to understand the failure, then move forward and make it a success. When we do that with our interns, we find that they can design things that they thought, wow, I didn't know I could do that. And it's like, that's the moment that we want because we want you to stretch. If you're not failing, you're not stretching. And we need you to stretch because then you'll become the person that we need later on as an engineer. Thank you. Okay, so um, how do we prepare our teams to succeed? Kendra, you were run, running an ops and improvement team for Blue Origin's New Shepherd. Can you talk to us about what you did to prepare your team to succeed? Yeah, so I think that um, one thing that we've discussed is, you know, capturing what happens when you fail. And that's kind of my approach to things is it's okay to fail as long as you do root cause analysis, figure out why did you fail, and then determine what are we going to do to make it different next time. So in ops improvement, I was also doing training. So it was paired really nicely together. Um, sometimes I would take our team out and we would execute like uh, dry runs or we'd either take out the launch vehicle or a model of the launch vehicle and just see where are our failure points. And we would do missions from end to end. So executing end to end, I think it's important that you see how all the testing that you do integrates into a full system. Uh, you can have a perfect system that doesn't fit on the launch pad. I've had that experience where people in one office designed flawless fluid systems and they literally didn't connect to the launch pad. They didn't reach the launch pad. Um, so you have to do a system end to end testing. I think it's important to capture the issue. So in on Antares and different missions, we might go out and do a dry run, but we didn't capture every single issue. At Blue Origin, my role was to go out every launch and capture everything that went wrong. And that can make me seem like a jerk when we get into a position reviewing with the team that I'm always finding the flaws. Um, but I think it's important for growth to identify the points where the system or our plans fail so that we can change them and improve them and be ultimately successful on launch day, not taking the risks on launch day. And so we would like, for example, on astronaut recovery operations, we would go out, run it till we failed. Then we'd go back and we'd discuss and we treated every operation the same, whether it ended in failure or success, we briefed prior to going out. We said, hey, we're out here to learn today. If you make a mistake, it's not your fault. It's the system's fault. We need to fix our system. We need to fix our processes. This is not the fault of individuals. So we always briefed and then we'd come back in and we debrief in a fault, fault free environment. So often um, we would discuss failures in the procedure is written incorrectly for this, not technician number three, you made a mistake when you, you torqued the bolt wrong. It was, what does our procedure say that is incorrect so that we can improve it so that we set our whole team up for success on launch day? And we always would follow this process, brief, execute, debrief, root cause analysis, find the failure, update the processes or update the engineering. If it's a mistake, like I said, on when the vehicle didn't fit to the launch pad, we said, hey, this isn't the failure of our fluids technician who couldn't get the connection. It's a design flaw. Let's go back and fix the design. 
So we, we treated every approach the same kind of um, brief, execute, debrief. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Stephanie, do you do something similar or different with your teams at Challenger Center? So I, I actually, uh, I've, I see a lot of similarities and that's pretty exciting. So just to give context, the Challenger Learning Centers, um, there's, there's a network of, of these centers and maybe some of you are familiar with them, but um, what they are is they're simulation um, based space um, centers and there's a lot of role playing for students. And so when students come to us, first of all, they've had some um, pre-learning with their, with their educator, with their teacher in their classroom. So they have some context to the mission itself. And when they come in, we do a pre-brief with every student and we go over our um, measures of success, our mission measures of success. And these are, are easy for students to meet because we always ensure the health and safety of the crew. That's always the number one. Um, and we're going to search for water and we're going to search for life on Mars. And so there isn't like you have to find them. It's just a search. And so we set them up for these mission measures of success, which we always meet and we never leave. I'm an astronaut on Phobos or on Mars. Um, and then we have our primary and secondary objectives. And so we usually have a main goal of the team of the task that we're all working towards. And then every group of students who we have several stations, biology, um, communications, health, but all of these different stations, they have their own primary and secondary objectives. And so we go over there, over these in the mission post brief after we're, after we're completed. And when we have students come for a two day situation where they do a mission with us and then they do another mission the next day, we usually allow the students to not meet all of their objectives. Um, when, we're, when we only have them for a day, we do some challenger magic and we, we push these objectives through um, on our own side but we allow them to not meet full success and we allow them to not be able to, to meet all of their objectives. And so a lot of times what this does for students is they come back in and when they're doing the pre-brief, it's never about any particular team or about a particular student. It's just the same thing. We're trying to figure out what happened. And a lot of times students are like, well, I think it's the solar flare or it was the, you know, it was that we didn't get our communication. It must've been down. There's all kinds of different scenarios that the students come up with. But the reason we do this is because as a district, we're really, we really feel strongly that students who receive feedback after um, any kind of scenario um, do better than just students who study. And so the feedback piece is really important and that's because it causes reflection. So when you get feedback, you reflect. And when you reflect, you're, you're gaining critical skills that you need for your life. And so this kind of, um, this idea of feedback, reflection, critical skills helps students learn from their mistakes. And the reason that's important is because I think Barbie mentioned this about her students, about wanting to just get, you know, get the A. We're really trying to shift away from the purpose of school is not to just know the answers or to get A's, right? The, the purpose of school is to learn um, skills that you need for your life. And so with that shift in thinking, we're also trying to shift away from like, homework, it's not homework, it's individual practice, it's practice. And so we're trying to, to make these shifts kind of, you know, district wide. And I think at the Challenger Center, we set students up so that they never fully fail at anything. And then we don't even use the word fail, right? We just don't meet all of our objectives. And I think that matters because we're all going to have disappointments in our lives and students will as well. And some students handle those better than others. And so it's important they have practice with safe in safe spaces in order to experience those emotions and how that feels. And so they may, may be better able to meet those in their, um, in their lives or as they go along in their schooling. Thanks. And Barbie, you did mention that, that kids can be so scared about their grades and the pressure to earn an A to get 100%. How do we make it more comfortable? And then Chris, I'm sure you, you can jump in here too, on allowing the failure that's required in order to learn. Yeah, um, and I'll go back to the, uh, there was one particular physics class. I, I literally had the kids and they were all lining up just to drop the class because they knew they weren't gonna be able to be, you know, so I just closed the doors and I said, okay, you know, I'll sign the paper right now that everybody has A's. I'll give everybody a 100% provided, you, you know, and so I showed them uh, Wolfram Alpha 
to where you could go and literally plug in the question and it's going to give you the mathematical answer. Um, I left the teacher textbook out with all the answers. And I said, you know, I said, you can turn in a perfect homework paper anytime you want. You know, it's there. I said, but now that we have the answer, let's look at the process. And so then we talked about the technique of, okay, so let's move forward with what we know. And then sometimes there's an area there in the middle you don't know. Okay, so let's jump forward to what we know the answer at the end is and let's work our way backwards. And sometimes it's meeting in the middle, but it's it's changing and, and it's not just kids. Uh, it's changing educators and society's process that it's okay to make mistakes, that it's okay, that that's where you learn from. And what I told my students, I said, I could give you a quiz every day of what two plus two is. And I said, everybody would make hundreds and would, but you haven't learned anything. And I said, if you don't learn anything, I said, how are you going to grow? And I said, if in the high school, you choose not to take classes that's going to challenge you to stretch and go and learn. I said, when you get to college, you're going to have issues. And I've had several students come back and say, you know, I was so successful in college because whenever I hit those road bumps and you, know, you taught me how, how to how to navigate, how to investigate. Not that that was really an engineering design process, but, but yes, getting them over that fear that it's okay to be wrong and to understand what it's like to struggle. And then, you know, how do you go, you know, students these days have Google. I didn't have that, you know, when I was growing up. So they have so many resources at their fingertips that they really can go teach themselves. And I'll say that, you know, even working at NASA, where my primary goal is to work with educators, you know, and whenever you're introducing a new activity to educators and it's like, you know, that's that's really what you want me to do. And their concern is is about failure. And so, you know, just starting at the get go of a presentation with educators and say, you know, it's OK if you fail, because that's where the learning's at. And, you know, and I think sometimes that's something that needs to be taught and we need to, I guess, kind of relieve the pressure. And one of my favorite quotes, I put it in the chat is John Maxwell. Failure isn't fatal unless failure becomes final. And, and Joe kind of alluded to that earlier as well. I mean, as long as you're going back and you're learning from it, you know, failure, failure is never really, you know, an, a, a real failure, I guess. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So um, this slide is titled preparing teams to succeed, but as you can see, we've come around to, yeah, but sometimes in order to succeed, we also have to enable failure. So how do we, actually learn from success or failure. And Kendra and Joe and Chris and I were all involved in this. Um, it's interesting how it happened that Teachers in Space had anything to do with this accident at Wallops Island. We ran a competition in 2012. After one of our summer workshops, we said to the teachers, here's a challenge for you, go back and work with your students over the year and send us your design idea for an experiment to be flown to the International Space Station with instructions for the astronauts to perform. And we got about 30 interesting design ideas. We chose our three top picks, the ones that we thought made the most sense, would be successful, would be interesting, there'd be a lot of learning from it. And then we submitted those three finalists to the student space flight experiment program from whom we had purchased a flight. So we, we had a flight, we just had to pick who was gonna get it. And the winner was a school, of course, in Melbourne, Florida, whose teacher just is such a fan of the space program and I'm sure did a really great job of helping her students come up with a really good experiment related to ALS and finding out whether there was a difference in the rate of enzymatic breakdown of proteins on the space station versus on earth. And they actually found a 40% differential. So it was really amazing. That experiment flew on the first space station resupply mission of orbital ATK out of Wallops Island. And we missed it because, right? This is another little bit of failure within success. Um, we all know that rocket companies are really careful about that first launch and the window within which the launch is acceptable is so narrow 
So there were date issues. There were all kinds of things that were finally ready. And by now it's January. And some of the worst crashes in spaceflight have occurred in January. And this was January from Virginia, not January from Florida. In fact, on the beginning of this particular launch window, those of us who were in New York were ready to jump in my car and drive down there. It was so cold. It happened to be below zero Fahrenheit. We almost couldn't get our cars started. And sure enough, it was too cold and the launch was delayed. By the time it was warm enough that they were within the acceptable parameters for the launch, there had been a solar flare and the radiation level was wrong. So um, we had to wait again. And by the time they were ready to fly, our teachers had to be back at school. They'd only had substitutes for so long. We had to go home, didn't get to see the flight. The flight was successful. The experiment was successful. That was all great. Our 2013 contest winner flew on the next flight, which was also in 2014. And this time we knew enough to take a week off and get down there and be prepared. We saw the launch. It was a success. The experiment was a success. And then we got a call from Nanorax, the integrator, saying, oh, we forgot your mission patches. Another school had won the competition to design the mission patch. We'll put those on the next flight. So they put the mission patches on flight three, and this happened. Then we got to learn what happens when you lose your rocket and your payload. We had to scramble a new set of mission patches. Nanorax got those up on a SpaceX launch. That made it to space and came back. And then the folks at Wallops Island found the Nanorax capsule that had the original flight mission patches inside it, and they were unscathed, and so we got those back too. So now we have the ones that went to space and the ones that survived being exploded. So this was super awesome. And Kendra, since you were actually involved with lo loading our mission patches, maybe you want to talk to us about the brief and debrief culture some more as it pertains to something like this. Yeah, so this uh, specific failure actually had just left the program. Um, so I wasn't working on this specific failure, but of course my team was. Uh, I think something that's important is that failure is always something that we prepare for. It's like plan for the worst, hope for the best. And so our systems are built to debrief and brief regardless of if it's a failure or a success, you treat it the same. Um, you know, there's a few things that are different when Antares failed, they locked all the doors, there's protocol that was taken to discuss, but at the same time you, you debrief, it's fault free, uh, you review procedures, you do root cause analysis, you identify the issues, you bring it back and you change the systems, the processes, the engineering, whatever it is to have a successful flight next time. Um, of course, a failure is more involved. There's a lot more research and a lot more investigation and a lot more, you know, in this particular case, there was multiple payloads, there was multiple insurance companies, there were a number of companies looking to find who was at fault, which kind of muddied the waters, but it, it's still the same process. It's debrief, uh, root cause analysis, update the changes or make the changes to processes and to engineering. Thanks, Kendra. And look at this in the chat. Pam Krause is the teacher whose students designed that winning mission patch. She's on our call today. She says, I'm proud to have my Chem 2 class have been a finalist for one of the TIS flights. That's right. They were also a finalist in the um, experiment competition as well. So multi-talented class there. Designing the experiment was the best experience ever for my class of five, five kids in Chem 2 in Kansas. It was my Chem 2 class patch, Liz is referring to, such a crazy turn of events. So just for fun, since we have another hour, I'm going to ask our moderator if there's any hope of sometimes in such a conference, a member of the audience can be turned into a speaker. If we can have Pam join, I'd love to give her a minute to talk. Meanwhile, let me go to Chaz talking about success and failure as labels Reality is a spectrum. Um, well, I mean, as several people have already pointed out, yeah, you know, what is a success and what is a failure? Um, I mean, success sometimes is obvious. You you have a goal to get something into orbit, and it's in orbit. Um, and uh, it's sort of the, the spectrum is more of the failure. If if the failure leads you nowhere and you learn nothing, then then that's truly a failure. But if it is a stepping stone 
to getting where you want, it's, um, you know, you can, you can claim it's not a failure. It's just a step on a lot of One thing that occurred to me as people were talking was you know, to depersonalize it, as Kendra had pointed out, and Stephanie as well, um, you know, depersonalize the idea of it failure um, as being something bad. You know, one way of looking at any of these long processes is that think of it as there's a bunch of gremlins in your process ahead of you to doing something that's new or complicated or new for you. And they're there and they're not your gremlins. They're just waiting to be discovered. There could be none. You could be lucky or there could be just one or there could be hundreds of them. And so the process of going through a procedure is to find all those gremlins and, and document them and learn how to get around them the next time. And if you do that, there's nothing bad about finding the gremlins. You need to do it. They're there somehow in a process. You just have to discover them. So the whole thing is a process of discovery. And I think what I'm hearing people saying in their educational backgrounds, and I've done this too in a more limited sense in teaching some classes, is you, pr- you create an environment where you control that because you know how to get them to a certain point in some cases. Um, and you're trying to get them there without making it so easy that you didn't know how you got there. And so you didn't encounter any gremlins, not because you have to experience failure necessarily, sort of for your own personal development, which might be a good thing, but because that's how everything works. You know, if you have to do anything at home, you know, this is not just something you have to go to engineering school. Someone else also mentioned that too. Young kids know how to do that. I think Stephanie had said this. Um, it's sort of logical. You, you learn how to do things as a, how do you learn how to walk? You didn't follow an agile process, but you sort of did. You know, your body knows how to do that. And it's sort of taking that thing we intuitively know and getting more sophisticated by having to learn science or math to understand some of the complicated things we're doing. But it's still the same idea. And in some way, we unlearn it when we realize that we get punished for finding gremlins in a timeline that isn't approved of, you know, and so you fail a class or something and a bad thing happens. So no one does that on purpose, but that is our experience, I think. And to go back to thinking as, as an impersonal discovery of things is is what you're doing rather than failing if i could jump in on that um one of the hardest things that i've had to do with interns and even some of the folks that i've worked with is separate the person from the success or the failure it's i'm not a success i'm not a failure the system was a success the system failed where was the failure how do we fix it but really getting people to separate that whole well Oh, I failed. No, you didn't. It was there was something missing that prevented you from success. But you yourself are not a failure. That is just a hard concept to get across to people that you are not either a success or a failure. You have a success or a failure. Thank you. Absolutely. And Chris, you said you want to add some things. And then Pam has joined us. So go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I actually, um, I may backtrack a little bit here. I just want to cover a few things. Um, I was, I was watching um, Eileen Collins, her presentation prior to us coming on um, with actually my kids. Uh, I don't know if you know, she's a first female pilot um, of the uh, space shuttle and uh, Rick Serfoss, who I flew with um, in Southern California in a, one of the glider things that we did um, there. It was funny because she was talking about um she discussed that the, the fact that that some things that we overlook um, or just because we have success many, many, many times in a row, um, like a hundred some odd la- uh, shuttle launches prior to the challenge. And obviously that was, um, you know, a failure, but um, she said that they never had a problem with them before. And so why would we have a problem now? And so she went about the process and she said some of the mis- you know, the misconceptions or missed thoughts um, that occur sometimes in engineering uh, may even fit into the hacking part of it um, that they didn't realize that, you know, that that could happen. And to, you know, Rick Searfoss, um, when I was flying with him, you know, we were talking about the balloons and I said, geez, there's a lot of roads down there. You know, do you think, you know, there's an opportunity for a balloon, you know, for one of our payloads because we were launching the next day to hit the uh, roads. And, um, you know, he, he said, you know, take a look down there and look at the amount of land versus the amount of roads and, you know, the chances are slim and none. Well, I can tell you from experience that um, it, it can happen. Um, and, and that was one of the things I want to bring up is that over time, um, and, and we talked about, you know, 
a lot of the panelists talked about process and being able to analyze and being able to, you know, go through success and failure and which one, you know, to learn better from and, and things like that. And, and I can tell you from the experience with high altitude achievement um, and along with Barbie and, and uh, I forgot who the other one said it, but different students to learn in different ways. And even in the classroom, um, you know, most educators know that. And so both, uh, you know, failure and success can be ways um, to achieve success. It's just the way you go about doing it and the way you label it, like Joe just said. Um, I mean, we've been flying balloons for the last six years and we've learned um, that there are a lot of different levels of success. So like I said, you know, our first one, we wanted to get the balloon in the air. <laughs> I mean, we wanted to get more, you know, but, but that was our first success. Then, you know, just design process and being able to test all the different parts of the design um, in-house before it goes. And, and, you know, some of that, you know, and, and Eileen Collins was even saying some of that you can't test until it just happens. Um, but then you have to backload that data um, into those models so that you can use it at a later date. Um, you know, tracking the payload was another one, recovering payload, analyzing the data recovered. So those are all parts of, you know, that we've put together as far as levels of success and where we are, because, you know, sometimes we couldn't track the payload. We lost one, um, you know, and, you know, we didn't recover it. So the tracking went down. We lost the payload. We couldn't recover it. We couldn't analyze any data. So we were done there. There have been some where the last one we had, you know, video go down. Not that that's a big deal, but we had video go down. Uh, the first couple launches, we learned which sensors do not work um, at certain altitudes, or you have to adjust, <laughs> I guess, hack, um, you know, the sensor to make it work uh, above 60,000 feet. Uh, so there were different levels of success. And then we did have failure um, in there. But that, at you know, I some of the kids, that pushed them harder. Um, and some of the kids were, you know, were truly upset, um, you know, that things didn't work exactly as planned. And, and so, you know, that process started to begin um, with the older kids actually talking to the younger kids and saying, it's okay, this is where this is how far we got, you know, on this launch. Now we know what we have to do to make that better um, and improve. And it's not like Joe said, it's, it's, it's not the people that are failure, um, because it's all a learning process. So we're all learning as we move. And so, you know, some of it's done in house, some of it's done on the fly. I mean, the length of the, the, you know, I wouldn't even know the length of the cord between the balloon and the parachute makes a difference in recovery. Um, and so, you know, we learned that shortening that distance helps in recovery because it gets caught on less things. I mean, that just seemed simple, um, but we've shortened that and we've had more success um, keeping it out of trees. Um, but again, each one of those four things I just talked about can be broken down into their own smaller success um and go from there so and we've experienced it um but we just needed to work through that process um you know and the preparation was um you know either situation there has to be a procedure set up in place so that if something fails that you can see you know what failed um you know what part of it failed and be able to develop a process through or you know be able to develop some kind of debriefing uh, to analyze that process and to make sure we either make sure or try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Like I said, our last one, um, you know, it was kind of a hack and we lost, uh, we, we recovered the payload, but we could have lost it if, you know, I didn't have a tracking unit on every single piece of the balloon because that's just the way I am. Um, you know, we would have lost it, but we did find that piece. So we were lucky. Um, and finding that, we actually had video cameras that turned upside down and actually showed the engineering flaw um, that we kind of hacked to make that launch happen. Instead of going back um, and you know, rethinking the whole process, we kind of came up with a quick solution um, to our problem. And that problem became a problem. And so, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of that wrap up. I, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I wanted to jump in a couple other places, so I didn't want to um, you know, take too much time. But I, you know, I wanted to reiterate that that process is a big part of it, both the process of putting things together and also that process after recovery and looking at what happened. I mean, we take pictures of the payload and, and train on the ground before we even touch it because I, we want to know what direction it's facing and, you know, how it landed and what landed first because that makes a difference too, you know, drag and things like that. So, you know, that process and teaching that process to the kids prior to um, going out in the field 
and then having other kids teach um, the younger ones as they we bring them up that this is what we do. You don't run out there and grab it because we need to take pictures. Um, and so, again, that process, even after the, the balloon is down um, or the payload is down and, uh, you know, taking that payload in and, and going through the process so that we know what was successful and then maybe what was not so successful. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And Pam, welcome to our panel discussion. I'm so excited that you're here with us today. If you look at these questions, you're just the person I would love to ask these questions of. You met your deliverables. How did you and your students handle finding out that your mission patches were destroyed? Did, did you feel that that was a success or failure? What did you learn from that? And also, you've been involved with Teach Just in Space for quite a while. Sometimes your students didn't win a particular competition. And one of the things we've driven toward is to get away from 30 schools compete, one wins to, okay, 40 schools enroll, 10 of them get to fly. Can we get to 50 schools enroll and everybody flies? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the questions on this slide. Okay. Well, we did meet our deliverables in terms of we got the patch where it needed to be on time. And, and I will say the boys were very disappointed um, when when they discovered that the the patch had um, well first of all wasn't loaded the first time and didn't fly but but we knew there was another opportunity but when we found out that it had blown up it was another disappointment um, so uh, but but they continued to have that opportunity which was good you don't always have that and so what do you do with that disappointment is is something I think we need to talk about um, mine had a, another opportunity and then to um, later find out it kind of goes with, along with what Chris said um, you know has it ever happened that we've had this rocket blow up and think everything's destroyed only to find out that this little container of mission mission patches <laughs> was um, recovered and so we when we opened that envelope and we had two mission patches, we were very confused um, because we thought one was destroyed. So just, you never know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I think designing the experiment, um, there were some things there that um, as they looked at ideas and came across the constraints the tiny size that they had to deal with. They had these grandiose ideas and then they started looking at the constraints of the experiment and realizing that, oh, we maybe can't do that. Um, so, so working through that process, you know, to be selected one of the three finalists and, and, and looking at the comments that the judges sent back the, on the initial um, competition um, and seeing where, where they did well and things they could have improved um, was a good learning experience. Of course, then those went through another process and not being selected, um, you know, did we fail? Well, I, I think their initial reaction may have been um, that they, they felt maybe like they did, but as we processed it and talked about what they learned and, and just the opportunity that they had, even if they hadn't been selected as a finalist, that whole opportunity, I think every one of them would tell you now that that whole opportunity to design that experiment and, and be a part of that competition was um, very, very influential in what they went on and, and um, how, they, how they continued and what they went on and did in college. So definitely um, they're the type of students that Barbie was referring to, good grades, expected that they would get good grades. And so I think that that chance to fail, that chance to not necessarily be successful in the way that you hope to be is very important. And I think they learned an awful lot from that. So thank you. Thank wanna, you. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say I was actually um, I had only been on the job with NASA maybe two months whenever this happened. It may have even been less than that. But uh, from NASA's perspective, because this was a launch, a resupply launch to the space station. And um, one of the things that they had done was, OK, what all was on board? And then the call went out whenever they found out that there were student uh, experiments on board. 
okay, who were those students? What were they? And how can we get to those students and reassure them that we will do it on another lawn? You know, there was there was immediate reaction on the side. And I can say that from, from NASA in terms of how can we reach out to those students and, and reassure them that, you know, this this failure is not is not is not is not final, you know. So Excellent. and Barbie, along with that, because my students had done designed the experiment when that happened and it was our patch and we knew we could easily pull that file back up and get that patch. We talked about those students who'd put all that effort into getting that experiment ready and now had to maybe start over. You know, the design was still there, but they had to start over. And so that was also good. My students had some real empathy, I think, and realized that the patch was easy. Um, an experiment might not be as easy to, to have to start over with. Well, we actually had a group that uh, wasn't associated with Teachers in Space that had a um, payload on board this one as well as an experiment. And as with any scientific experiment, there's typically a control and an experiment. And so one of the things that they did to kind of swiftly make that turnaround was the control got sent to be the new experiment and they created a new control. Uh, at least that's how they did it in terms of making things work for them to be able to make uh, the next payload launch. But it, it really drove home that scientific process of why you have a control. And, an, you know, it's not you don't send just the only one. If, you're, if you don't have a, a baseline to compare it to, um, how, how do you how do you know what's changing? So anyway, thanks. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So much to talk about here. Um, let's get one more, though, if I can hit the right button. Why am I stuck? I'm stuck now. Thank you. Joe, using failure to improve learning. You talked about what you do with your interns. Yeah, I mean, really what we strive for, as, as it says here, is like we want the interns and our team to break it in the lab. Okay, we can't fix it when it's on orbit. Uh, once that satellite is deployed, that's that. It works or it doesn't. So break it in the lab. Always start there, um, which leads to the you know fail fast. You know, as you're trying something new. I, for example, when we first started building our pocket cubes, we iterated the design six times in the computer before we ever cut any metal. Um, we built prototypes with 3D printers to make certain that things would work before we ordered the parts, which are very expensive. So we do a lot of it in-house. We want those failures to happen fast. And you might think it works great, and you design it in the computer, and the math all works, and then you print it in the real world, and you find out, oh, I can't get a screwdriver there to turn that screw. That has happened to us. Um, it's You just have to be ready for that. So be ready to break it. You know, um, The the unknowns when you're dealing with new stuff are going to bring unknown failure modes. Uh, if you have that process, as has been reiterated time and time again here in, the, in this presentation, it's about process. Follow your process. When it fails, fix the process, adjust, move on, and keep doing that. Um, really, that fail fast is important. Um, it's something that we did in software. Uh, the big turn now is uh, get to minimum viable product. Okay. Well, if you hack into that minimum viable product, you're going to have a hard time reverse engineering that hack. So if you follow your process and move fast and break small segments of it, but document what you're doing, you'll end up with a working product. Again, for us, we want to fail in the lab, not on orbit. On orbit is a bad thing. And because of that, we follow... Um, we follow a process called the Rama process here. And that is everything we build, we build in threes. So in the example where you know the, the experiment was lost, so they used the control, and then they had to build another control. Well, we would have another satellite ready to go that's, and still have the one in the lab that we can poke around with and find those failures. That's just a good way of doing it. But again, you've got to get to those. you got to train people. Uh, it is it is hard to train for success and failure and celebrate that success that's that's the other thing that when, when, when someone has a success acknowledge it recognize it 
show them to, that yes, this is a success. Make certain you document everything that you've done successfully, and then let's move on. So you know, that's what that's what we do. We we try and train our interns to think not just in the engineering process mode, but you know what are what are the feels? How does everything work? Don't let it affect you when when you do have a failure. And, fail fast. Thanks. And Stephanie, I already used your example and I appreciate it about how you work with your teams. So if it's okay, what I want to do right here is ask Hashi to talk about how you have worked with your students because we just lost another one, right? We, we lost Serenity. You were looking forward to running a blockchain experiment. How are you using that failure with your team to prepare for the next time? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, it all comes down to how we define success in the first place. And oftentimes people define success fairly narrowly uh, and is rather binary. You either hit the target or, uh, or, or you failed. Um, but uh, if you define success somewhat broadly, uh, you'll sometimes be surprised that success may take some time to mature. Uh, and, you know, I started uh, as an undergraduate student at Villanova University. Uh, and we were involved in the space program. We were trying to fly experiments in the space uh, back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, unfortunately, we, we were never able to get uh, a flight up there before NASA discontinued the program. Uh, now, 30 years later, I'm a professor at the same university, uh, and we're about to fulfill the university's original mission of getting an experiment in the space. Uh, so uh, it, it sometimes takes uh, time for success to actually materialize. All the things that we learned and the things that we experienced 30 years ago, they're all coming back. Uh, so, so that was an investment uh, uh, from the university's perspective to get us to this point. Um, yes, we, we've lost the satellite, we lost the experiment. Uh, this is just another feather in our cap towards uh, the ultimate success. So uh, I, I talked to the university, both faculty and students, uh, and really remind them that we are on the road to uh, successfully launching an experiment, and this will be the first of, of many. Uh, so I think people do need to define success a little more broadly and realize that sometimes it takes success time in order to, uh, to show itself. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We are up to our final prepared question for discussion now, and this one is on maximizing the learning from failure or success or both. And here I want to turn to Chaz actually, even though this is a picture of a Blue Origin success, because I wanna hear more about what you're doing at Spaceport. Spaceport has been around quite a while and there have been times when you may have wondered whether you were going to achieve success. Talk to us about some of the things that you have experienced over the uh, beginnings up until the present and now what's coming on with Spaceport. Okay, um, yeah, well, I've been there for just about two years, so I haven't experienced the entire range, but there are people there that I work with all the time who did, and so I've heard these stories over and over again. And um, yeah, the, the, actually the first launch from Spaceport was in 2006, a suborbital flight by a company called Up Airspace who's still flying. And the impression, of course, when you're at Spaceport is everything is Virgin Galactic, which is very understandable because that's human spaceflight and that's getting a lot of attention. And that is the anchor tenant. And that's sort of the reason that the Spaceport got, got approved. But that development process has taken a long time, as, as often happens. So people have interpreted that and the reputation has been that nothing has happened at the Spaceport in, since until Virgin Galactic actually arrived just a, less than two years ago on the site. Um, but there, you know, uh, yeah, Spaceport essentially is a platform. So a lot of the things that we're talking about and what Kendra's talking about and Joe's talking about and, and Hashi's talking about in your experience in launching to space, these are our customers. You know, Spaceport, we don't do any of these things. We, we could watch this happening sort of from a distance and sort of behind a veil. We need to know enough about uh, launch operations to understand uh, what charges are going to be needed, what infrastructure might need to be added, what safety issues there are. But beyond that, these are startups. I, I think of us as a startup spaceport catering to startup companies. So there's multiple levels there of success or failure. And 
honestly, we just see the end product of that. Uh, the customers don't need to share with us their details of what they're doing, except for the specific things that relate to safety. So it's sort of a, you know, watching it from a distance, like other people are doing as well. And interesting to see. And so we see lots of times people are coming in first time ever trying to launch anything and it doesn't work out very well um, at all. And a lot of you know, disappointing moments and very awkward moments. Like you could just see the excitement and maybe people's investors are there and the board of directors or somebody who's involved and kabloom, you know, nothing. And so it's, it's heartbreaking to watch, but it's also heartening to see them even in those moments building up their courage to say, we're going to do this again. And, and, and uh, so you can see how, you know, the setback, call it a setback. If you want to not call it failure, it certainly feels like failure. Um, affects other people. So from the space point of view, it's interesting because I can't say I directly am involved in that process. I can sympathize with it as a, you know, an engineer in a former life, not in flight operations, but um, to know that's the only way you can look at it. So it's kind of like a window into watching this happen multiple times from multiple, multiple customers. And um, uh, so uh, like, again, all I can say is, is seeing people go through it it's very clear that no matter what you do, like you said, I think everyone's launch you had said um, from your experience, Elizabeth, is is going to fail, you know, uh, very visibly sometimes. The spaceport, it's not so visible, fortunately, for some of the companies because you know, we're not on the coast launching very large rockets. But it's visible enough to the people that matter to these people who are doing flight operations. And, of course, there's been so many successes as well. Um, and, you know, is is a delay, you know, Virgin Galactic obviously has gone through a lot of delays. Um, they haven't met the schedules they wanted to, like any other aerospace company, never, you know, almost never does. Um, is that a failure? You know, I could argue that that's a success and that they didn't take chances that they shouldn't take. They understand the, the risk levels. The risk levels are very different from a university trying to launch their first rocket with someone's CubeSat that, you know, isn't gonna make it higher than 10,000 feet probably, you know, just the way it works out versus launching people. And I know, you know, Virgin certainly knows that. Again, we don't know the inner workings of the company. We don't need to. That's not our purpose. We're the platform for these companies to work at. So it, it, it is you know, so much frustrating to watch because you can't help. You want to reach out and say, well, let us understand this. And we have engineers here. We could talk to you. They don't need us to do that. They don't want us to do that. And so our job is to stay, stay back and, and tell us what you, when you'll need us and what you need from us, if anything to solve the problem. Most of the time they don't need anything for us. They're gonna go off and do their own work and, and uh, continue on. And we get to see what the result is the next time. So and that's been my experience at Spaceport so far. And that's gonna continue. What we hope of course, is that our main customers uh, learn from their successes. Like I said, we have a customer launching since 2006. They've been doing it regularly. They want to expand, but they're doing it profitably. And they are sending uh, payloads and suborbital flights and recovering them uh, very reliably now. So there's a whole spectrum there, um, but but clearly more geared towards, like I said, since these are startups, towards the uh, uh, challenging part of their, of their um, flight test. Thank you. Thank you. So to wrap it up from the presentation perspective, I thought about this success. Um, this is a payload picture from the recovery of Blue Origin's capsule that can fly passengers. That's why it has windows, can also fly payloads, which is what happened when we were there. This was a 2019 launch of CubeSat payloads that rode on blue on uh, New Shepard and then were recovered the same day. So we got to go out and see this capsule be hauled back. That was very exciting. And then we even got to take a launch pad tour and see the target that the rocket returns to and go up on the catwalk and Erica Wagner, their business development manager, made sure we understood that someday when we get to fly, this is the very catwalk we'll use to enter that capsule. That's like one of the worst teases of my life. I'm still waiting for that to come true. But, um, you know, it may be within reach now. I hope so for all of us. Um, so these are many of the customers who had payloads flying that day. And I thought when putting the slide together about all the types of success that were required 
for this moment to occur, for the payload to be recovered. First, we had to get funded. And in my years with Teachers in Space, I came on after a grant had already been obtained. Teachers in Space was a project of the Space Frontier Foundation. And the original team earned a grant in 2010 to produce the workshops in 2011 and 2012. And I was brought on to run that project after the first summer to see the grant through, improve the flight experiments workshop and see the program succeed. And we've had a lot of success since then, but we did not immediately succeed at getting additional funding. In fact, our next successful NASA funding was the Flight Opportunities Grant proposal we wrote, which funded this flight. And after this flight, this success, then things just began to happen. Two weeks later, we were offered the flight with Firefly. Um, we've received a grant from Blue Origin since then. So success breeds success. Uh, not only was the funding successful, but our experiment was a success. And this was built on Chris and his students' original experiment with the Geiger counter. So that experiment has had iterations of success. There was a new vehicle integration that Joe built so that instead of having to fly our own batteries, as we do with the balloons and with Perlan, we could get power and data from New Shepard itself in addition to the data we collected. Um, Chris then turned that around and implemented that integration with his balloons so that he now separates the vehicle payload from experiment payloads and customers have the opportunity to also receive power and data from the balloon vehicle payload or fly their own. Um, so the flight was a success. We got the payload back. We got the data back off the payload. And we can remember from our early days with balloons, even before we were working with Chris, um, when we were just figuring it out, sometimes the data was no good that we got back. We didn't adequately understand how to convert the data that was recorded by the Arduinos into something that we could actually make sense of. So learning how to design and recover that data, how to analyze it successfully. On this particular day, we watched the launch, then Blue Arch and said, okay, everybody come have lunch. And we had this great lunch. And then they said, here's your payloads, right? So we got our payloads right back, just like a balloon flight. And I borrowed a screwdriver from somebody at Nanorex who were doing this integration as well opened it up, pulled the chip, put it in my laptop, dropped the data in a spreadsheet and emailed it to Chris and his students had a chart of it that afternoon. And he sent it back to me like that. That was amazing. So that was a huge success right there. Plus everybody around us was opening up their experiments and some were successful and some were not. So we're learning from them so much. We learned by being there with these other customers who are all universities. We were the only school level experiment. Um, and then, of course, the press coverage that goes with that. You get press when you fail, too, but you get even more when you succeed. And then the new opportunities. So um, lots and lots and lots to discuss about failure and success and how they integrate and how we use them. I want to know if we have questions from our audience. We do not. So I want to give the panelists the opportunity because I love listening to you guys talk with each other. And maybe I will go back to Stephanie now to start it off and see if you have a burning question or comment that you want to share, and then you call on somebody. Yeah, absolutely. So I really, I've enjoyed, even though I'm one of the panelists, I've enjoyed listening to all the panelists. And so I'm wondering from those of you in industry, you know, what skills or what can we be doing as educators to help better prepare our students um, for this type of industry, especially because we are trying to build up the STEM workforce. And that's one of our goals, especially here in New Mexico, where it's it's such a prevalent option for students. And so, yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit about what, what you guys are looking for and how we as educators can help prepare our students. If it's okay, I wanna jump in on this one because I have one request from education for uh, really our interns, for all of our folks, communication. You can have the best idea you could solve world hunger you could solve the climate crisis you could solve any of it you've got the idea you've proved the math out great if you can't tell anybody about it the idea is useless that in itself becomes the failure 
they need to know how to communicate. Um, it, 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 it sounds like, okay, well, why do I need English? I'm an engineer. If you can't write out what you did, it's not going to work. If you can't get up in front of an audience and tell them what they're doing, if you can't get on Zoom like this and have a discussion about what it is you're doing, it's as if it never happened. So to me, in industry, the big thing that I want, communication. Teach communication. Okay? We, we, we know that STEM is, is fantastic. It's really changed things. The, the level of interns that I'm getting now are light years ahead of what I was getting. Um, when I was working in rocketry back in 2004 and 2005. Okay? I love it, but they still can't communicate their ideas. And that, that, that's what we need. That's what we need in industry. <laughs> so I, I want to jump in and say something there, Joe. You made me think about who can talk about what they're doing and what they're failing at and who can't. And the difference between government, nonprofit, and eventually for-profit, but not yet with investors, right? And the need to only look like you're succeeding while you're still trying to get funded, as opposed to having a mission to actually share what you're doing regardless. And I wonder, Hashi, you have worked both in finance and now in education. Do you see this? Do you see that there are sometimes difficulties working with companies as opposed to working in education and research areas? Well, the areas do operate a bit differently. They have different objectives. Companies are very focused on profits. That's, you know, obviously for their survival. Education is more longer term thinking. They're, they're very focused on the educational process. So these types of institutions are driven differently. And therefore, the way they expect people to communicate and operate and the skills that they bring are slightly different, at least how they emphasize uh, the contributions people are, are bringing to those organizations. They're measured a little differently. Um, but I, I would definitely have to underscore what, what Joe is mentioning, is, is that importance of communication. It is the glue in any of those types of organizations regardless. You have to be able to take ideas that you have uh, and communicate it to your peers. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, engineering solutions, especially if you are in STEM, uh, they're not always done alone. Most of the time, they're done in groups. And therefore, your ability to function in a group, uh, to work with your colleagues, to share information uh, clearly, accurately uh, within teams uh, is essential to achieving uh, the organizational objective. Uh, but kind of to your, to your point, Liz, the, the type of organization you're in, and that can vary by industry, and it also can, can vary by uh, sectors, uh, whether you're profit or, or you're educational. Uh, they will have certainly different uh, ways in which they're looking to emphasize types of communication to achieve their objectives. Thank you very much. Yeah, if, if I could jump in just for a second, Liz, <laughs> on that same thing, um, and I know I'm not in the industry, I'm, I'm more education, but um, I'm getting into the industry. The, the thing you're talking about communication, I think even as educators and uh, you know other educators can agree with me that I don't think we communicate as well either. And that's a, that's a, good point is that we should almost learn from that ourselves because communication between the educators um, is important as you know because as department head now um, the science department that's my job is to communicate the information for the next gen standards down to them um, and so you know it's a point about communications and then an example a perfect example of what Joe was talking about because Joe was involved and Liz was there um, when we were in, when we were in uh, Benin, Nevada and I had one of my students there and we literally built uh, you know, engineered and built a payload um, container for the Perlin that day. And without the communication between all of us um, that day, I don't think we would have, I mean, we had one cut up and, and taped together by the time we're done, ready to 3D print, um, you know, within 24 hours. And so, but if we didn't communicate and, and look inside the Perlin, see what we had, and even Austin, you know, I was amazed at what he did, but being able to say, hey, is this what you're looking for? And you're over there building it. And he's there designing it on 3D print. Um, and it was quite the experience for me because I kind of stood back and was able to absorb all, uh, you know, absorb all that and, uh, and watch it. So, you know, that communication uh, piece is important to not only teach our students, but sometimes to think about ourselves as well. Yeah. If I may. Oh, okay, Kendra, go ahead. 
I just, one thing I wanted to say, because I agree that communication is key. I also think that um, with communication comes collaboration. Um, something that I often tell students is space is not just for engineers, space is for everyone. You know, uh, having some of your teams be made up of not just people interested in math and science, but maybe bringing someone with creative skills in who can communicate, who can put together a presentation that tells a narrative, that tells a story, uh, you know, having a finance person come in to run the budget. Uh, in industry, you have everyone. Um, you don't have to just be an aerospace engineer to go to space anymore. You can be an influencer. You can be an accountant. You can be all these people. If you have a company of just aerospace engineers, you don't have a company. And Chess. Yeah, and 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 Kendra sort of just beat me to it because I was thinking, <laughs> you know, we're talking about communication and the more basic thing, and, and this is something that I think surprised me when I got into this in the early 80s when I was an engineer out of school. And it's different now because there's a lot more group projects that all of the people here are talking about now and really wasn't as prominent in the past where you sort of did homework assignments and took tests and that was what engineering was. And then you went in and you started doing engineering. And I immediately found out, oh, this is a group project. Nothing is done by yourself. There's no homework assignment. Uh, there's no test that you take in a room by yourself and prove you know how this is. There'll be tests along the way, but you're sharing in something. And that's really critical. That gets to the communication. And you're, and you're right, Kendra, it's actually expandable to many groups. But even if you just live in a very highly engineering uh, uh, focused company, you might just be surrounded by engineers, but it's a group of engineers because no one's going to know how to do this whole thing completely. And it's not all top down um, or it shouldn't be. Uh, but there's some of that. Uh, so that's a key thing. And teaching the students that the part of the work that they're doing while they're trying to solve a problem is how you're working together is what you're going to take when you go into a workplace. Uh, the second part of that is when you get out there, no one told me this either at the time, was every place is going to have different cultures. The corporate culture you go into is key, whether you're going to like it, or not like it. And you don't, you may not have any way to know ahead of time what that's going to be. So there's cultures we're talking about startups. I started out in a big company and some people would hate that, but I learned a lot because there were processes in place. So I learned immediately what works and doesn't work, which I needed at the time. And I worked with people who were very good and experienced. Now, uh, some people would say, well, that'd be too boring. And I want to go into a startup where people are you know, inventing it, and they're okay with that. But it's more chaotic, potentially, maybe requires a little more uh, grit or something. And some people have that. And, and there's nothing good or bad about any of these. And you could change from one to the other. You could start out in one culture and say, well, now I'm going to try a different one and grow that way. But tell people that that's true. So if you get into a place you don't like, don't feel bad about it. You know, it, it maybe learn and how to, to, to mold in, but realize that eventually what you're trying to do is find that right group of people. And that's where you're going to really have an exciting career when you mesh what you really want to do with the people that you're working with. And they sort of think kind of the way you do, not exactly. And so you, 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 you bounce off each other and, and, it, and it can involve a lot of diversity as Kendra gets to and with people with different skills that actually works better when you get a group like that, because not everyone comes in with the same uh, answers. So um, uh, that, that's been my impression. That, and, and so keep up with the, the good work with all this group uh, efforts to do this and, and get the students to realize that that's, you know, if you're enjoying that, then that's what you'll enjoy when you go out and work. Thank you. Chris, I know you've taken off time from class. You have to get back to class. Do you have any last comments or, or something you want to say to another panelist before you have to go teach some more? No, I was just saying, I, I put in the chat, it's, it, it's been a great experience. And, um, you know, it's nice to, to have these conversations um, and be able to um, be part of it. Um, you know, it's and, and success and, and failure, either way you look at it, um, you know, it, it, it depends on how you look at it, I guess you would say. And, um, you know, coming down from, you know, telling people that they're not failing and, you know, letting them know that, you know, it's something either in the process or in the end result that doesn't happen doesn't mean that the, people, that the student or, or the people are, are the failures. Um, it just means something didn't go um, quite as planned. And, um, you know, live with the success. And I, I wanted to add a Joe, this year we've added a pizza party um, to the end of 
every single one of our flights. Um, and the reason why is because we don't want to, we want, we don't want to differentiate between failure and success. So, you know, if we have a success, you have a pizza party, if you have a failure, you don't. Um, so, well, you know, we want to try to have those and, and it's, it's an investigation party. So really we're, we're analyzing data and looking at things and, um, you know, maybe looking at some video and pictures or whatever, but, um, it's a debriefing, but you know, the pizza party thing makes it sound, you know, exciting. And, you know, it's like a post-launch party, I guess, you know. Right. That's All right. Really well, thank you, everyone. Um, and it's been great. Um, I do have to run, though, because I am sure there are kids in my room already, and I am <laughs> on the other side of the building. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, anybody else have a point that they want to make sure they get to as we approach the end of this really fun discussion? I yeah. Wanna- Say this earlier and I'm sorry I'm saying so much but I want to say I really liked what Chris said about the pizza party regardless um, we started the program out talking about shame associated with failure and Chaz mentioned some good interesting things about Virgin and taking a long time I feel like Virgin really got a raw end of the deal from the aerospace community and SpaceX has really championed celebrating failures um, allowed the rest of the community to do so as well So I think SpaceX is a great example of how they leverage PR and they talk about their failures publicly in a way that lets other aerospace companies not crumple under the failures that they experience. So if you're looking for examples of how to celebrate failure, uh, SpaceX does a great job of that publicly. Kendra, I'm really glad to hear you say that. That was much clearer than what I was trying to ask at the beginning about what do you do when you're still trying to get funded? That's often the excuse for secrecy. SpaceX turned that on its head by by acting like engineers and by saying, look, this is going to happen. We're, we're trying to figure it out. Yep. And, and I um, felt that difference yeah. in my own job as well. We went from shame uh, of our failures in the public eye to, hey, this is how we learn. And I think that can be done at the classroom level, too. When you have students return with a failure or with a success, you still share it with the whole school. You still celebrate. You still publicize it because you're still moving forward. Awesome. All right. I think that brings us to the end of today. And thank you, everybody, for helping us learn how to celebrate and learn from both success and failure and make the most of each so that we continue our successes and enable our communities to succeed as well. Uh, This is being recorded and we look forward to sharing it and we look forward to following up with any of you who want to talk with us further after this. Uh, What's that? Website, yes, the website is teachersinspace.com and there's hyphens between the words and I guess I have to share my screen again if I wanna show that. Okay, Noah's gonna type it into the chat. And we're in the process of migrating. We bought tis.org and we're gonna move to that, but for now it's still teachers-in-space.com. All righty, here comes the typing of the website. There it is. Thank you all very much. I look forward to working. We're all going to be working together on stuff and it's exciting and we'll see you in space. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much for giving us your time and your expertise. Bye-bye. Thank you all.